Next up, we have Guillaume, and he's going to be talking about statelessness and Burkle trees, a really interesting and awesome topic. And uh, without further ado, I'll let, I'll let him introduce uh, himself and take it from here. Welcome. Here we go. OK, perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, so cool. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, statelessness and vertical trees. So I'm uh, I'm Guillaume from the from the guest team, uh, just like Marius, and I've been uh, like in the past six months I've been working on what uh, comes after the merge. So I yeah we wanted to share a bit, uh, let's say an overview of, of what's coming, uh, what to expect uh, after the merge. Like the merge is the, is the big thing on the horizon, but uh, there's more exciting things uh, uh, coming after that. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been mo mostly uh, working on uh, on vertical trees, but I've been asked to to give an over uh, like a broad overview of statelessness in general, what's coming. So uh, I'll cover uh, I'll cover a bit of that as well. And the first question is why uh, why do we want to to achieve statelessness? And it's uh, it's pretty simple. In fact, uh, have you tried to, to synchronize a, a node recently? It's, uh, it's taking a long time. Um, you need a lot of data. So that, uh, that really prevents a lot of people from, from joining, like smaller devices, uh, phones, or Raspberry Pis. I mean, Raspberry Pis technically can do it, but it's not very sustainable. Um, there's a lot of uh, centralization uh, associated to this. Um, you need like a lot of people using Fiora, um, and uh, there's also the the problem that, for example, a DApp developer or anybody, um, there's a lot of data to download, but not everybody is interested in all the data. In fact, most people are not interested in in the data. So uh, it would be great to have uh, just to be able to download the the data that you care about and and keep on uh, keep going on with the rest of the of the network so this is uh, these are the goals that we're trying to to achieve and so uh, there's basically three components uh, with uh, uh, that yes yeah, state statelessness is uh, is uh, has three main components uh, there's vertical trees the, this is the technology we're going to use to uh, to basically make statelessness possible because it uh, may it allows for very very small proofs or yeah much smaller than what uh, um, we used to to have uh, until now. Uh, there's the the state expiry, which uh, is uh, something that has been attempted many times in the past, but uh, is coming back with uh, with a new tech a new technique called address space extension that I will cover. And uh, the last uh, the last um, uh, component is state networks. So um, the, since syncing the state is so difficult. Uh, the question is, can you can you just uh, avoid dealing with uh, all that state? And uh, um, so this is yeah, this is the question, this answers. So let's get into um, into the uh, vertical trees. Uh, currently, we we have a, a Merkle Patricia tree, so it's using hashes. Each level hashes its children and and so on uh, until the top and hashes have been very useful in, in the past but the problem with uh, with hashes is that if you get the whole uh, commitment if you sorry if you if you have a vector of values and you just want to prove that one value is in the vector and you're not really you don't want to reveal um, what's uh, what's next to it you can't really just take the hash oops sorry you can't really just take the hash and um, and take that value and somehow prove that uh, this value is at this specific position in the source data. The only way you can uh, you can prove that is by passing the entire vector. Um, so you have other uh, like uh, an alternative technique to that has many similarities with uh, with the hash is a vector commitment. You have a vector, you commit to it, you, you provide a commitment, but they provide also they also have the ability to uh, to find an opening which is a smaller uh, piece of data compared to the size of the vector that you can use so if you have the commitment plus the data plus the opening you can prove that this data was indeed at this location in the vector and um, you can use this to to hide some data if you don't want to reveal all the data 
but the reason why we care about this is not because we want to hide data that is public. Uh, we just want to use it so that we don't have to pass all the data. And this is quite important because if you use, uh, like if you want to prove that something is in the current tree, um, you have to, because you're using a, a hash, uh, you have to pass all the, all, all the siblings of a, of a given node along the path. So that's uh, 15, like the, the Merkle Patricia tree has uh, each node has 15 siblings or 16 children. And you have each time <clears throat> at each level, you have to pass all 15 siblings. Um, and uh, the depth of the tree on average is uh, seven, eight. Um, so you have 15 times eight, uh, 32 bytes. It's a lot of data. So because of what I explained about uh, vector commitments, you could use vector commitments to just pass the data that you need, add some commitments, and uh, that's already for each level, much less data. And on top of that, uh, the, the depth, the average depth is four. And the reason for that is because since you only pass, like the, the number of siblings doesn't matter, you can have much larger uh, like nodes with many more children. And because your tree becomes uh, much larger, uh, it becomes automatically less, less deep, uh, so more shallow. So you, you pass, you, you move on from, uh, from a structure that is really, really high and, and not, that, uh, not that large. I mean, the MPT is quite large, but, it, uh, but a vertical tree would be larger. Um, and uh, it would be shallower, which means you, you also reduce the number of, uh, of items in your proof, uh, which yeah, contributes to making the, the proof smaller. And there's also um, a f an interesting point that I'm not going to, to cover really uh, today. It's the fact that in uh, currently you have a tree for all the accounts and then each account has its own tree for storage. We're no longer having that with vertical trees. Everything gets merged into one giant, uh, giant tree. Uh, but yeah, I, I won't cover that. It's just uh, good, uh, like interesting to know. Uh, one question uh, that uh, comes often is people say, okay, but if you have a commitment, um, if you don't have to pass the siblings, why not pass you know, a single, a single vector commitment with uh, only the data you want. And uh, that's, um, that's a good idea, but calculating a commitment takes a lot of, uh, a lot of time, just like calculating the hash of all the data takes time. Um, so what you do is you try to look for a sweet spot that uh, makes smaller proofs, but uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't require a lot of time to, to compute. And so we chose, uh, we chose 256 children. Uh, initial implementation or initial proposals were uh, 100, sorry, 1,024 children, but uh, it made things more complicated to implement and 256 children seems to work. So uh, this is what we, we went for. Um, so yeah, com um, just a general comp uh, comparison of, of proof sizes uh, between Merkle and Verkle. The first, uh, in the first case, you have the leaf data. Um, so, sorry, in both cases, you need to include the leaf data. But in the case of Merkle, you have for each level, which is roughly seven, you have 15 siblings, each uh, of, uh, of which is 32 bytes. So if you have 1,000 leaves, that's roughly three megabytes. And we're getting in a block size. So we want to have the, the proof integrated inside the block. And as a result, uh, that, that makes a block that is, uh, you know, Bitcoin territory, basically. And uh, in fact, bigger than this. So instead of having a block every, uh, uh, every 10 seconds, 10 ish, 15 ish seconds to that gets propagated over the network, uh, you need, uh, yeah, you need 10 minutes, maybe, maybe more. Um, so that's, that, that's why the, the Merkle tree, and that's why we want to switch the tree, uh, the tree that we use to store the data, because uh, that's impractical. Whereas vertical trees, um, so you index, you have the the index that uh, the the child is in the in the node, 
um, you have the, the value, you have the commitment to it. So it's, uh, um, it's a slightly larger value, but you only have four levels and you don't have the siblings. So you end up, um, even though you have a, a, a tiny overhead, I mean, um, the, yeah, it's uh, um, insignificant, not insignificant, but you, it's definitely not the biggest contribution. So you end up with a with a block size of roughly 150k. Sorry for the proof. So the block size it, it basically doubles the block size, um, and uh, that's much more uh, manageable. Uh, right. So uh, the next idea is uh, state expiry, and uh, th the idea is that because the state is getting. Uh, too big in, in Ethereum, that's uh, like the, yeah, there's the state bloat problem. And because you end up, um, you know, when you store something on Ethereum at the moment, you pay some gas, but the implicit promise is that this, uh, this value you store will be kept forever. So that's effectively uh, free. Um, we, we want to go back on that promise a bit because it, it causes state bloat. So the idea is that after a while, um, the, the data expires. Of course, uh, it's not completely forgotten. There's, uh, we keep, we start with a fresh tree. Uh, we de delete the data from the previous tree, actually from two trees ago. And, um, but we, we keep the root so that if you have a proof of your data, that your data was present in the tree, um, at that time, you can resurrect it. You can bring it back to the to the current epoch. Um, so there's a you pay an extra cost to bring it back, um, but if you don't need it, uh, you can still just keep the proof and um, and just uh, let it. Uh, yeah, wait for the time you need it uh, to pay the resurrection cost. So. Uh, Right now, we are, so we, def, we divide uh, the time into periods. The period zero is the one we're currently in, but uh, when this, the state expiry scheme becomes active, um, it will, um, you will have one period each year or each six months. And uh, when that happens, you freeze the, the tree of the previous period and you start with a fresh tree. So we had period zero, what you do is you start adding values to it. Uh, and you, so far, you still need to, uh, you still have to keep the data of the previous, um, the previous period. And when the period one comes to an end, what happens is you start again from a fresh tree. You are still obliged to keep the data of the previous period, but the, the period before that, you, you can delete the data and you just keep the root. So you can start adding more data to it. And uh, when you want, for example, to, if someone wants to recover uh, data from peer zero, they pass a proof um, and that gets included in, uh, so the, the data gets brought from peer zero into peer two. One thing uh, that um, is not uh, specified on this, on this uh, diagram, is that uh, the data had to be absent from uh, from period one? Um, so the, the when when the, the data that uh, green data got uh, recovered from uh, from period zero, there was a check that it was not present in period one. If you find yourself at period three and you want to uh, resurrect something from period zero, uh, you have to pass a proof of absence. That you have to prove that the, the value you're trying to resurrect was not in period one, because uh, otherwise what could happen is, for example, Alice has some funds in period zero. She transferred them to period one. Then she transfers some funds to, to Bob. Period two happens, period three uh, happens. And then Alice resurrects um, the funds she had in period zero. And that's a double spend. So to make sure this does not happen, you need to pass a, a proof of absence. Um, right, so uh, this uh, state expiry uh, uh, 
like mechanism uh, comes with uh, what's called an address space extension. So um, we had addresses that were 20 to 32, uh, sorry, we uh, currently uh, in Ethereum, the address are 20, 20 bytes and they are the first 20 bytes of the hash of your public key. So um, now we want to make those address 32 byte long, but we don't reserve the 32 bytes like the this is not the whole hash we only take 26 bytes of the hash and then the remaining six bytes are uh, used for uh, well half of them are used for versioning and uh, yeah future use and the other um, three bytes are used for uh, like to to denote the epoch sorry I, I keep saying epoch but it's actually a period um, it's uh, used to denote the period that um, that the, the address was first accessed. And the reason for that is because there's a cost associated to resurrection. So for example, if uh, Bob wants to send Alice uh, some, uh, some tokens to, to Alice, but Alice hasn't resurrected the, the address, uh, either Bob pays for the resurrection cost to, uh, to resurrect Alice's account, um, but if he doesn't want to, then um, um, he can send it to an address that is also controlled by Alice um, in the sense that, um, for example, so I, I have this example here. Um, for example, let's say Alice owns the public key, sorry, the private key that controls address 000. Uh, she has a balance here. Um, and then let's say uh, Bob sends, uh, yeah, Bob has uh, address 01, for example. So both those addresses have the, the counter zero because they have been seen for the first time in, uh, in, in period uh, zero. Then you period one happens. So uh, this, is, uh, this is not in the, in the period one tree, but Alice might receive some funds from Bob and Bob's instead of resurrecting this address from Alice, actually uh, sends it to Alice, but with an address uh, containing the current uh, uh, period. So it's, uh, it's seen for the first time at this address in period one. Um, and Alice still has the, the private key that controls this hash. So she can still, uh, she's still the owner of the funds, but uh, it's like she has two addresses with one private key. She has two addresses now. And in period two, uh, Alice might want to get the, the the value she had locked during period one, so she she passes a proof um, to resurrect the address, and uh, we can see that the value that was in period zero is now available in period two, uh, and uh, the value. So when Bob sent some funds to Alice in period one, this value was not overwritten. Alice now has uh, one, two, three, four ETH in one address and a 9101 uh, in another address. So that's uh, an interesting scheme. It's also a fairly complicated one um, because, uh, yeah, I, I like to make this joke, uh, address state extension uh, like ASC uh, can be pronounced ASE, which is sweat in Japanese. I think uh, implementing it uh, is going to require a lot of, <laughs> a lot of sweat. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's nice because it makes uh, state expiry, at least it proposes a concrete approach to, to state expiry, which is something we've been talking uh, uh, about for, for uh, yeah, a few years already. The problem is that it's still quite complex. Um, we like a lot of contracts on the on the on chain today expect a 20, uh, 20 byte address, and they actually use the twelve remaining bytes for something else. Um, so it would not work. Like if they are given a thirty two byte address, it's going to to break the contract. Uh, so there's a good idea by uh, the Ypsilon team uh, bridge contract. I'm not really going to um, talk about this today. It's it's quite uh, involved, but it's it's promising. But uh, let's. I mean, I, I don't want to to uh, to make uh, uh, false promises. Uh, it's it's a very complex scheme, and um, and statelessness thankfully does not entirely uh, depend on it. So it's nice to have, but we can still launch without without it. The last. Uh, 
the last component is state networks. So um, there's uh, the main proposal is uh, by the Piper and the Python team, the, the portal network. And the idea is currently you have to get all your data. Uh, like when you want to, to participate in the network, you need to download the data from uh, like all of it, most of which you don't care about. So the idea is to provide a, a network alongside the uh, uh, the the block propagation and propagation network, where every um, every machine on the on the network only stores a fraction of the data, and if you need it uh, on a on a per need basis, you can go and query that data to one machine or to a, a subset of all the machines. Um, as you need it, and that's uh, that's quite nice because that's really I mean it has many applications. First of all, you don't have to to store all the data, obviously. But even if you want to be, a, for example, a validator in ETH2, you don't really have to to store the data yourself. You could uh, you could uh, just send uh, send your request, uh, ask someone else to to store the data for you, and uh, request the data when when you need to to propose a block. Um, of course, I didn't say that, but uh, that data is validated. You have to pass a proof, uh, which is where vertical proofs, once again, uh, are interesting. Although I guess vertical proofs could work at this at this stage. Um, so the roadmap is, yeah, basically uh, vertical tree is uh, is almost there. At least uh, we have a prototype. We have we are going to build another prototype with uh, uh, using. Um, Using Rust vertical, so uh, yeah, there's uh, there's Geth that currently is able to to produce vertical blocks with vertical proofs, and um, and Ethereum JS is interested in writing a stateless uh, a stateless client or uh, that will just execute blocks without actually don downloading the data, um, and then when vertical has been delivered, uh, address space extension makes. Uh, um, like can be also delivered, but if it's it it turns out to be way too complex, you could also uh, skip it. And the portal network, like I said, doesn't really require um, um, like vertical proofs per se, so it could be delivered independently. And uh, when you have uh, at least two, but uh, preferably three of these uh, of these things, uh, you achieve uh, statelessness. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, running out of time, so I'm just going to uh, to uh, like I had this slide to to explain a bit what uh, what stateless Ethereum would look like uh, in the future. Um, the biggest thing to know is that your data, like to realize that your data won't be kept uh, accessible forever. You have to to keep your proof, or you have to pay someone to uh, to give you a proof. Um, but it uh, it allows for uh, for nice uh, more decentralization because ultimately you you would not need to rely on uh, on infura or on uh, or on um, on miners or slash validators uh, the data could be spread all over all over the network and you could just download what you what you need and you could also why not make a make a, like make a profit by hosting data for for other people so. Uh, yeah, overall, it gives a uh, it gives a, a more decentralized, uh, more decentralized world, a more accessible world because uh, there will be like uh, lighter clients will be able to join. So yeah, um, all those people that are currently priced out of the of of the network because they for whatever reason they don't have the the space or the bandwidth or whatever to to join uh ultimately and uh, we hope can can also uh, join the party and uh yeah that's it i don't know if we have time for questions but i think it's uh hey we um we are a little bit over but i think we can do a couple of questions because um hopefully i think they're a simple one so um there's three questions here um some of them might be uh, related to each other. So the first one is, uh, what kind of proof is used to bring back data after state expiry? Um, so that depends. The first, uh, the first tree is uh, is is an MPT, but it needs to be converted uh, to. It will be converted to vertical. At least that's the plan, over time. Uh, so initially, like let's say it's going to be a vertical proof. Yes. Got it. Um, 
would vertical trees help lower gas prices by letting us store more transactions per block? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe Vitaly can pitch in on this one. I think he's in um, he's in the, the chat, but uh, my understanding is uh, no. All right. Well, um, maybe Vitaly gets to comment when he promote him in a, in a minute. Um, what uh, possible alternatives are there to ASE? Okay, yay, I got promoted. Um, I guess, <laughs> okay, the, 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 the question was um, if I can be a, uh, if uh, wood vertical trees allow us to increase scalability, um, I guess. Or lower gas, gas, or, gas price. Right, right, right. Increase the gas limit and lower gas prices. I guess maybe, right, because right now state size is uh, a, a big bottle, one of the big bottlenecks on uh, increasing the gas limit. And if we add vertical trees, and if we add proposer builder separation, so if we have both of those things, then we can move toward the world where the only actors that need to be stateful would be the yeah, builders, which would be a, a, a much smaller number of nodes. Um, so if we have that world, then like we can, I feel like the, the negative consequences of letting the state blow, blow up to like a terabyte or what would be lower, right? So um, I think uh, increasing the awesome, it would be safe there, but then like, adding state expiry as well would uh, allow us to, put, to go even further. Um, we'll do one uh, more quick one. Um, can users pay state holders trustlessly or will this happen out of the protocol? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear. Can, uh, can, pay can users pay state holders uh, trustlessly, or will this happen out of the protocol? Uh, trustlessly. Yeah, I mean it's not uh, okay. I'm not I'm not an expert in the in the protocol, but um, I know like if I compare to light clients, uh, that's exactly what happens. So I, yeah, I'm gonna say yes. It's uh, it's gonna happen in the protocol. Cool. Or at least it's easy to implement. Let's say. Trent, hopefully that's a satisfactory answer. If not, I uh, will ask him to. Uh, put the answer in chat and follow the discussion there. Thank you so much. That was a really awesome overview and uh, yeah, appreciate your time.